Welcome to Come Follow Me, week 18 of the Old Testament. We're going to be covering Exodus 24. We're going to be covering Exodus 24, as well as chapters 31 till 34. You'll notice that from now on, because the Old Testament is so large that we're going to cherry pick some of the chapters, it will be impossible for us to cover every single chapter. However, if I do come across some things that are interesting, that I think that we should talk about that are not in the assigned reading, I will include some of those things that I come across. From the Old Testament Institute Manual, we saw in our last lesson how the Lord began the revelation of the law for Israel with the ten principles that summarize the way in which men are to deal with God, with their families, with their fellow men. Immediately after the Ten Commandments, the Lord revealed the whole series of laws and commandments which we now call the Mosaic Law. It is unfortunate that many people, some even in the church, think of the Mosaic Law as a substitute for the higher law of the gospel. We call it a lesser law, and so it was, if the word lesser is used in the sense of progressive steps. But some people assume that lesser means of lower importance and significance, or of a lesser level of truth and righteousness. This is not the case. Note what other scriptures teach about the law. From Doctrine and Covenants 84, the law of Moses was a preparatory gospel. From Mosiah 13, it was a very strict law of performances and ordinances designed to keep the Israelites in remembrance of God. From the Book of Mormon, the law of Moses was highly symbolic, being filled with types and shadows, all of which pointed toward Christ and his future atonement. In the New Testament, the law of Moses was added to the gospel, not given as a substitute for it. And also, the law of Moses was given as a schoolmaster to bring Israel to Christ. In summary, when you study the law of Moses, you can expect to find a witness of Jesus Christ and the gospel principles illustrated in the laws given. Many of the laws may no longer be required, but the principles taught are eternal and will never be set aside. Two other characteristics of the Mosaic Law are important. First, much of the Mosaic Code is case law. One scholar explained that the law does two things. In order to understand the biblical law, it is necessary to understand also certain basic characteristics of that law. First, certain broad premises or principles are declared. These are declarations of basic law. The Ten Commandments give us such declarations. With this in mind, that the law first lays down broad and basic principles, let us examine a second characteristic of biblical law, namely that the major portion of the law is case law. These specific cases are often illustrations of the extent of the application of the law. The law then first asserts principles, second it cites cases to develop the implications of those principles. This may sound more difficult than what it actually is trying to tell us. The Ten Commandments give us a general view of the laws, and then a lot of what we discover in the five books of Moses are examples of how to institute these laws, or practical examples of what is done where the rubber meets the road. Second, the law is primarily negative. Eight of the Ten Commandments, many of the other laws deal with what ought not to be done. Many today view negative laws with distaste. They feel they're very restrictive. The appearance, however, is false. God gave the laws to Israel not to shackle them, but to guarantee the greatest individual freedom. A negative concept of law confers a double benefit. First, it is practical. A negative statement thus deals with the particular evil directly and plainly. That law thus has a modest function. The law is limited, and therefore the state is limited. The state, as the enforcing agency, is limited to dealing with evil, not controlling men. This is really an important concept of the Old Testament law. Second, and directly related to the first point, a negative concept of law ensures liberty, and except for the prohibited areas, all of man's life is beyond that law. If the commandment says, Thou shalt not steal, it means that the law can only govern theft. It cannot govern or control honestly acquired property. When the law prohibits blasphemy and false witness, it guarantees that all other forms of speech have their liberty. 
The negativity of the law is the preservation of the positive life and freedom of man. Remember that in God's preface to the Ten Commandments, he said, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. In saying this, Jehovah reminded Israel that the very purpose of the law was to make them free and to keep them free. By using the negative, they therefore ensure a greater degree of liberty. Exodus 21 through 23 is not included. However, there are some specific examples within here I think that we should look at. There was no state slavery. It was an individual situation, and most people became slaves because of debt. These chapters, which are often referred to as the Covenant Code, provided mercy and protection by recognizing that there was no difference in the value of a debtor as a human to anyone else, even though they had become a slave. There was also justice that was still provided. Slavery was for a specific time in order that you could receive forgiveness for your debt. And there were strict rules about how you were to be treated. Even though you might be a slave, you're not considered property, but you had access to rights and protections. Spiritually speaking, we accumulate a debt that we cannot pay, but the mercies of the law of God provide a way that we can be redeemed. This is the lesson that's built into the law of Moses. At the end of your service, a slave had the option to stay with the serving household, and many actually gave up their personal freedom in order to choose the security of staying. The law allowed for that. A lot of the law of Moses seems very foreign to us. For example, the eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But it's also another example of equality. Everyone's eye was precious. They were equal. The law did not license retaliation, but it set a limit to it. This assured that only the guilty was punished and the victim was given appropriate compensation so that the punishment fit the crime. It prohibited unjust re revenge or retaliation that might escalate. This is significant and unique in the ancient world. We often see this in our families when our children run into trouble, where one hits another, where the retaliation will usually be a harder hit from the victim to the attacker. And then it escalates. The law of Moses rejects that response, appropriate compensation and no more. Let's look at specific example. These are from Exodus 21. If men strive together and one smite another with a stone or with his fist and he die and is laid up in bed, if he rise again and walk abroad upon his staff, then shall he that smote him be quit. Only he shall pay for the loss of his time and shall cause him to be thoroughly healed. So what this scripture is talking about is that you're only entitled to compensation that equated your loss. If you hit someone and put them flat on their back for a while, you're only entitled to the compensation for the loss of your time and not for anything else. If we look at chapter 22, there are specific laws regarding stealing and destruction. In verse 7, if a man shall deliver unto his neighbor money or stuff to keep and it be stolen, let him pay double. A specific amount was issued. He had to pay double the amount. Verse 18 is kind of interesting. The original Old Testament scripture indicates, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. But we have found from the Joseph Smith translation that in fact this is incorrect. Joseph Smith corrected this to say, Thou shalt not suffer a murderer to live. Verse 28 is also interesting. The original Scripture indicates thou shalt not revile the gods. However, this is not a very good translation. And Joseph Smith picked this up by changing it to against God, not the gods. The problem here is Elohim, which we use as the term for Heavenly Father, is actually a plural in Hebrew. From the Old Testament Institute Manual at the back in Enrichment A, it talks about if we pursue the Hebrew text further, it reads, The head of the gods said, Let us make man in our own image. I once asked a learned Jew if the Hebrew language compels us to render all words ending in hem in the plural, why not render the first Elohim plural? He replied, That is the rule with few exceptions, but in this case it would ruin the Bible. He acknowledged I was right. 
These are the words of Joseph Smith from Teachings of the Prophet. In Exodus 23, there's some interesting scriptures here that talk about meeting the livestock of an enemy. Even though they're your enemy, you have to help. You have to return to him his property. From Boyd K. Packer. Sometimes you cannot give back what you've taken because you don't have it to give. If you've caused others to suffer unbearably, defiled someone's virtue, for example, it's not within your power to give it back. Perhaps the damage was so severe that you cannot fix it no matter how desperately you want to. Fixing that which you broke and you cannot fix is the very purpose of the atonement of Christ. When your desire is firm and you're willing to pay the utmost farthing, the law of restitution is suspended. Your obligation is transferred to the Lord. He will settle your account. Now we actually get into the reading for this week. And here we find that Moses is commanded to go up to the mount with Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and 70 of the elders. Further in Exodus, they're commanded to make several sacrifices. And Moses takes half of the blood and puts it in basins. And half of the blood he sprinkles on the altar. And then he took the Book of the Covenant. These are the three chapters that we just finished, chapters 21 through 24, right after the Ten Commandments. The people covenant to do all that the Lord has requested and to be obedient. And then Moses takes the blood and sprinkles it on the people. Now this, to us, is very strange. Remember that this was a very symbolic gesture. And he says to them, Behold the blood of the covenant, which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. Now, we don't have time today, but on Thursday, we're going to go more into the symbolism and how it connects to the sacrament. From Elder Bednar, Most of us clearly understand the atonement is for sinners. I'm not so sure, however, that we know and understand that the atonement is also for saints, for good men and women who are obedient, worthy, and conscientious, who are striving to become better and serve more faithfully. We may mistakenly believe we must make the journey from good to better and become saints all by ourselves. The gospel of the Savior is not simply about avoiding bad in our lives. It also is essential about doing and becoming good, and the atonement provides help for us to overcome and avoid bad and to do good and become good. The enabling power of the atonement of Christ strengthens us to do things we could never do on our own. So as directed Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and 70 of the elders go up the mount, and they see the God of Israel. And from verse 10, And there was under his feet as if it were a paved work of sapphire stone, and as it were the body of heaven in his clearness. This is not talked about a lot, because it's hard for many of the Christian churches today to explain the fact that they saw God. But of course, for us, this is not a problem. Now, Exodus 25 through 30 is not really in our reading assignment this week. I've given a little synopsis of each of the, the chapters here, but we're going to actually cover the same thing in more detail next week, so I'm going to leave it for next week. It's kind of a duplication. In chapter 31, the Lord speaks under Moses, and he calls some specific people by name. One of them, Bezalel, is said to have been filled with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship. We can see from this artistic rendition that Bezalel and Aholiab are two individuals who the Lord has blessed with specific skills. They are given specific artistic skills to enable them to complete what we just skipped over in chapters 25 through 30, which are specific instructions on the ordinances and the equipment that will be needed in the tabernacle. The next section here is about the Sabbath day and keeping it holy. In verse 13, the Lord speaking to the children of Israel says, Verily my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. In verse 14, the penalty for not keeping the Sabbath is clearly outlined as being death. That's very harsh for us today, particularly because this is one of the Ten Commandments that the world has really relaxed on quite a lot. Within the Ten Commandments, the Sabbath day was a point where 
the Lord pivoted from individual commandments into group commandments. But the Sabbath day is both. There's a certain aspect of the Sabbath day that is a group commandment. In verse 16, we find that it's a perpetual covenant, that it's a continuous sign between the Lord and the children of Israel. From President Nelson, How do we hallow the Sabbath day? In my much younger years, I studied the works of others who had compiled lists of things to do and things not to do on the Sabbath. It wasn't until later that I learned from the scriptures that my conduct and my attitude on the Sabbath constituted a sign between me and Heavenly Father. With that understanding, I no longer need lists of do's and don'ts. When I had to make the decision whether or not an activity was appropriate for the Sabbath, I simply asked myself, what sign do I want to give God? That question made my choices about the Sabbath day crystal clear. I remember very distinctly this talk in 2015, and it actually had a huge impact on my life, because from that time forward, I really looked at what I did on the Sabbath day, and had a huge impact on me. I actually made some dramatic changes in, in my life as a result of this understanding of the Sabbath day. Chapter 32. Moses is delayed on the mount. He's up there for 40 days. And the people gather together, and they talk to Aaron, and they convince him to make a golden calf. In talking about Moses, they say, we don't really know what's become of him. And I think they were very troubled about what would happen if he never came back. And so Aaron tells them to give them all of their gold, and they bring it to Aaron. He uses his tools. He makes a molten calf. And then says, these be your gods. He then built an altar and made a proclamation that the next day would be a feast day. So the next morning they offer burnt sacrifices to this image. And according to verse 6, the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. In the meantime, the Lord instructs Moses that he needs to quickly return to the people because they have corrupted themselves. They've turned aside They've made a molten calf. They're worshiping it and indicating that these be the gods of Israel which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt. That's a little difficult for us to understand how they would so quickly turn from Moses and the Lord and all that he had done for them. It's kind of like when we read in the Book of Mormon and we say to ourselves, how did the people turn so quickly back to wickedness? From President Kimball, we have the following. Idolatry is among the most serious of sins. Modern idols or false gods can take such forms as clothes, homes, businesses, machines, automobiles, pleasure boats, numerous other material deflectors from the path to godhood. Intangible things make just as ready gods. Decrees and letters and titles can become idols. Many people build and furnish a home and buy an automobile first and then find they can't afford to pay tithing. Whom do they worship? Certainly not the Lord. Many worship the hunt, the fishing trip, the vacation, the weekend picnics and outings. Others have as their idols the games of sport, baseball, football, bullfights or golf. Still another image men worship is that of power and prestige. The gods of power and wealth and influence are most demanding and are quite as real as the golden calves of the children of Israel in the wilderness. In verse 14, it reads, And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. But this doesn't sound right, and it's not right, because Joseph Smith changed this in his translation to say, And the Lord said unto Moses, If they will repent of the evil which they have done, I will spare them and turn away my fierce wrath. But behold, thou shalt execute judgment upon all that will not repent of this evil this day. Therefore see thou do this thing that I have commanded thee, or I will execute all that which I had thought to do unto my people. In verse 17, Joshua hears the noise that's coming from the camp of Israel, and he thinks that there's a war going on. But as they get closer in verse 19, they see the golden calf and the dancing. And Moses gets really angry. And he throws the two tablets, the Ten Commandments, that he has brought down from the Lord, and they break. Then he takes the calf that they made, and melts it down, grinds it into powder, and mixes it with water, and has the people actually drink it. 
Now, obviously, this is very symbolic, but it intrigued me, so I did some research, and scientifically speaking, gold is considered uh, chemically inert. That means it can't really be ingested by the body. Gold is actually edible, but it won't be absorbed by the digestive system, and therefore it just passes through your body and becomes a waste. There was some speculation that it might cause you to get sick, but that's not true, although I'm sure it tasted kind of gross. Aaron explains in verse 23, For they said unto me, Make us gods, which shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man that brought us out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. We've been gone for 40 days. They had no idea what had become of him. And I said unto them, this is Aaron, Whosoever hath any gold, let him break it off. So they gave it to me, and I cast it into the fire, and out came a calf. I had to chuckle when I read this because sometimes when you are breaking up a fight from between your children, this is exactly the type of thing that happens. They don't take responsibility. It just happened. Verse 25. And when Moses saw that the people were being riotous and had kind of let loose and let everything go, he stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. Now there's been some thought that perhaps there was some editing done here, although Joseph Smith's translation doesn't correct it. And this next part is not something that you would learn in primary class because the Lord instructs them to take their swords and to slay everyone who's not going to be with Moses. And that day there are some 3,000 people who are killed. Now, I don't know that we have all of the story here. And on Thursday, I'll present to you some ideas, some thoughts of what historians have said about this. Verses 30 through 32 prefigure the Savior and his atonement and sets up Moses as a type of Christ. Verse 30, And it came to pass that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord, Peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sins. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, O oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. From the Old Testament Institute Manual, some have wondered why Aaron, who played a key role in the Golden Calf episode, came out with no condemnation. Though it is not recorded in Exodus, Moses later indicated that Aaron also was nearly destroyed. And I've included the scripture from Deuteronomy 9.20. And the Lord was angry with Aaron to have destroyed him. And I prayed for Aaron also the same time. So not only did Moses intercede for the people, but specifically for Aaron that he wouldn't be destroyed. On to chapter 33. The Lord instructs Moses to pack everything up and be on the move because he's going to take the people which he brought out of Egypt into the land which he swear unto Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob to give him a specific land. They're, of course, speaking of the promised land. And I will send an angel before thee, and I'll drive out everybody in the, in the land that's there and give unto them a land flowing with milk and honey. In these next verses, 9 through 11, Moses enters the tabernacle, the people see the, the pillar of clouds, and rise up and worship every man in his tent door. This is reminiscent of the Book of Mormon story, when the tower was built by King Benjamin, and all the people sat in their tent and listened to him. And then we have another instance where the Lord speaks to Moses face to face, as a man speaks unto his friend. There's a bit of a contradiction some 10 verses later, in verse 20, when the original transcript says, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. But Joseph Smith remedies this problem in the appendix by saying, And he said unto Moses, Thou canst not see my face at this time, lest mine anger be kindled against thee also, and I destroy thee and thy people. For there shall no man among them see me at this time and live. For they are exceedingly sinful, and no sinful man hath at any time, neither shall there be any sinful man at any time, 
that shall see my face and live. He goes on to say that he will cover him with his hand, and that he'll take his hand away, and thou shalt see the back parts, but my face shall not be seen as at other times, for I am angry with my people Israel. Verse 34. So in this chapter, Moses hews two new stone tablets, and he goes back up onto Mount Sinai for 40 days. Now from the JST version, we have the following in kind of a little preface. God again writes the law on tablets of stone prepared by Moses, but takes the Melchizedek priesthood and its ordinances away from the children of Israel. He gives them the law of carnal commandments instead. You can see there's quite a lot added in in the JST. And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two other tables of stone like unto the first, and I will write upon them also the words of the law, according as they were written at the first on the tables which thou breakest. But it shall not be according to the first, for I will take away the priesthood out of their midst. Therefore my holy order and the ordinances thereof shall not go before them. For my presence shall not go up in their midst, lest I destroy them. And I will give unto them the law as at first, but it shall be after the law of carnal commandment. For I have sworn in my wrath they shall not enter into my presence, enter into my rest in the days of their pilgrimage. Therefore do as I have commanded thee. And then in verse 14 there's also a change. In the original text it says, Jealous twice, but Joseph Smith changes the first jealous to Jehovah, which is the name by which the Old Testament people came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 6, it talks about the Lord God being merciful, gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. This is part of the Old Testament that a lot of people seem to gloss over. They don't talk about his forgiving nature, the Lord's ability to wipe away our sin. When Moses does come back down with the second set of tablets, he doesn't realize that the skin of his face is shining. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel see him, they're afraid to come even close to him. It shines so much so that in verse 33, we see that he has to wear a veil. He takes off the veil when he goes back to see the Lord, but when he comes back down to talk to the children of Israel, he has to put the veil back on. From the Old Testament Institute Manual, after such prolonged time and such experience in God's presence, it's no wonder that Moses' face shone with divine glory when he returned, and the people fell back in fear of him. The Hebrew word here rendered shone is karan, a diminutive verb from the noun meaning horn, denominating radial beams of light, like the horns of the rays of the morning sun. It's interesting to note that when Michelangelo crafted his famous Moses, you can see that there are horns on his head. The Hebrew word used to mean either radiant or shining is this Quran that we talked about. It shares the same root, the Q-R-N, for horns, which is Kirin. In fact, in modern Hebrew, the word used to refer to the ray of sunshine is this Kirin, as if speaking of the sun's horns. And so we can see that even in the art world, mistranslation has an impact. I hope you've enjoyed this overview that we've given of this week's reading. I again remind you that we are going to be accelerating the speed with which we go through the scriptures simply because it would take us several years to do it chapter by chapter. I would encourage you to continue your reading and supplementary reading for the areas that are not specifically covered by Come Follow Me if you have the time. Regardless, I look forward to seeing you on Thursday or at least seeing you in video so that you can continue your study. And then, of course, our Sunday lesson is coming up very shortly. Have a great week.